Isaac reminded us that we have 10 whole days left until Christmas. But because this year we're doing things a little differently, we're not reading from the lectionary during the Sundays of Advent, we're going to read part of the story of Jesus' birth today as recorded in the second chapter of Luke. We're going to read verses 8 through 18. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I tell you, I get goosebumps every time I read that. Sorry, I'm up here just, just all a Twitter. God is good. All the time. How'd you know to do that? How'd you know to do that? Um, it's not a rhetorical question. How'd you know to do that? Isaac. Saw it in a movie one time. Okay. Did not know that was in a movie. Um, if I said to you, um, the Lord be with you, what would you say? You're very good. I can never say that, though. All these years of saying that without thinking, I think I've told you this already about the bishop who visited a church and was up here fiddling with the microphone, and he said, there's something with the mic wrong with the microphone, and the entire congregation said, and also with you. <laughs> Call and response. We know what it is, right? You hear something and you respond to it. Where else do you see that? You see that in church? Where else do you see that? Anybody here in the military? Did you learn how to march to a call and response? Let's do one together. I say part of it, you, you sing it back to me. I used to drive a Bonneville. Okay, Bill, you were in the military. Stand up, you're gonna lead this with me, pal. <laughs> Who else was in the military? You all stand up. I don't remember the Bonneville one. Well, you could just repeat what I say, and then we'll say it. We're going to do it together, but Bill's going to get him to. I used to drive a Bonneville. I used to drive a Bonneville. Now all I do is run uphill. Now all I do is run uphill. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, three four. four. Sit down. You're all. <laughs> What is the point of those cadences? Let me ask, we've got a drummer here, don't we? We've got some members of the Delaney High School marching band here, don't we? What is the purpose of a cadence? Keeps in step. And I was in the, Del I was in the first Delaney High School marching band back in 1902. <laughs> John Wesley, Abraham Lincoln, they were in the band with me. And you had to know your own cadence so you could tell your cadence from the band in front of you or the band behind you when you're marching in a parade. You had to know your cadence so you could march. Uh, and all these call and response and cadences, even those in the military, really trace back to the slave songs of the 19th century in America, the African slave trade. Because what happened was the slaves would bring their rhythms from their home countries, their music, and then they would mix them with the stories of redemption, especially from scripture. Now, we use these in other ways because they aid in memorization. Because you have to remember, the slaves were not allowed to learn how to read and write because what happens if you learn how to read and write and you're educated? What happens to you then? You have power. And there was a concerted effort to keep these folks from having any power. But they would learn these stories and they would share these stories in song partly because it took, the mind off, took their mind off their work. Let me ask those of you who were in the military, did the cadences take your mind off marching ever? Yes. 
They did? Okay, well that's a good thing. How about in the marching band? No, we knew we were marching the whole time, but still, it makes it easier. There has even been research done for those who have gait instability, anyone with Parkinson's disease or something that makes you walk off balance. Did you know that if you wear some sort of earbud or whatever they call them now and listen to music in 4-4 time, you will walk better? That's absolutely been proven. So it keeps you going in the right direction. It takes your mind off what you're doing. It helps you to memorize. And in the slave songs, it helped them to send messages back and forth under the watchful eyes of their oppressors. Because what they would do was they would substitute words for the slave masters and the taskmasters who would beat them. Sometimes they were called weasels in the songs or other animals. Sometimes they were referred to as the pharaohs because the story of Moses and that story of God's desire for freedom for the people would speak powerfully to people living under oppression, and it still does today. But mostly these songs were a way of expressing their feelings, their lamentations, their fears, their anger, and their hopes. Call and response is a powerful thing. We have been reading stories of call and response through the Sundays of Advent. Who first got called by the angel Gabriel? We played a game yesterday. Who was, who was uh, Jesus' mother? What was the question? Who gave birth to Jesus? Somebody said his mother. <laughs> the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, and what does he open with? What do angels always start out with? Do not be afraid. And then he tells her this ridiculous story. Even though you're not married, even though it could mean your life would be taken from you, you could be stoned to death, even though people will look down upon you and ridicule you, don't be afraid because God has found favor with you. And what did Mary do? She said, may it happen to me as you have said. I am the servant of the Lord. Here I am. Then we have the story of Joseph. Same thing. Angel shows up and says what? Don't be what? Afraid. Don't be afraid to marry this disgraced woman. Don't be afraid of being shunned by people. Don't be afraid of being talked about and gossiped about and rumored about. Because the child she is carrying is holy. And what did Joseph do? He did what the angel told him. You were here last week, right? Or you've read this story before. He did what the angel told him. I remember once going to... Um, Sight and Sound in Pennsylvania. Have you been there for their Christmas show? And I went with my husband, the Southern Baptist, who did not like Sight and Sound very much because at the time of Jesus' birth, an angel flew out with a sword and the devil flew out with a sword and they literally flew around on top of the stable having a sword fight. And the midwife in the drama says, oh no, the mother's in trouble and the audience gasps. My husband says, don't worry, it comes out okay. <laughs> followed by, I want chapter and verse on that one. But these stories of call and response today, the angels call to the shepherds, and what did the angel say? What did the angel say? Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, because I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people, all people, not just the shepherds in the field, but all people everywhere, every time, every place, the entire world, who was, who is, who is to come. Everybody who'd ever lived, everybody who ever will. Good news for that whole crowd because to you is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And now what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go and see this thing that has happened. And how do the shepherds respond? They go. Y'all, it's the second chapter of Luke, okay? If you haven't read it before, maybe you can find it in a movie. Isaac found... <laughs> God is good all the time in a movie. I'm going to ask you something now. I want you to think, think through this. What changed for the shepherds that night? What changed for them? Let's start out with the easy question. What didn't change for them? They were still shepherds. Still the bottom rung in Jewish society, which was under the thumb of the Roman Empire. You don't get much lower than a shepherd. The only people lower than shepherds in that society were the people who slaughtered animals. 
because it rendered them unclean and they had to go through a ritual purification process. So the shepherds are in the field. What happens when you leave your flocks in the field? What's probably going to happen to the shepherds? What do you think? I've got a hand up back here. People could come and eat them, or animals could come and eat them. You're absolutely right. And the people who owned the sheep, which were not the shepherds, would probably be very angry, and they might get beaten, if not worse. How comfortable was it being in a pasture full of sheep? Have you ever been in a pasture full of sheep? Pasture full of sheep? I have been in a pasture full of sheep. Because the youth group that I had at Harmony Church that I just left would make movies at Christmas time to show to the younger kids. And they made a movie, and we borrowed a field of sheep. I have never been colder or more miserable because they are the stubbornest, most ridiculous animals of all time. The head sheep's name was Buford. And every time Buford just decided, I am not going to act. You cannot make me act. He would go tearing off, and all the other sheep would follow him until their shepherd came out. That's another sermon, because she called, and they all just flocked to her. But Buford did not want to be photographed. So how comfortable is it being in a sheep pasture at night? It's not. There's no bathroom out there, folks. There's no heat. They may have a fire. They may not have a fire. They have a stick. Have you ever held a stick? Would you like the stick to be the only thing between you and a wolf? I would not like that. Did, did any of that change for the shepherds that night? Do you think any of them lived to see Jesus grow from an infant into their savior? Do you think any of them lived 33-ish years? Some of them may, but none of them lived long enough to see the Roman Empire collapse. It took a lot longer than that. So some things did not change for them that night, did they? But what did change for them? Hope. Absolutely. What else changed for them? Joy. I think we could say that while nothing changed in their day-to-day -day lives, everything changed for them. Everything changed for them because they saw God's Messiah. They saw the promise to the people of Israel for generations and generations. They saw it themselves because the angels did not come to King Herod. The angels did not go to the Roman Empire. The angels did not go to the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the learned people who thought that they were better than all the other Jews and looked down upon them. He went to the poorest of the poor because they were the people who needed the good news more than anybody else. And when you really need good news and God sends you an angel, that's good reason not to be afraid anymore. And they ran and they saw the baby and they shared the story. And his mother, we didn't read that part, but she kept everything and treasured it in her heart. And what did they do then? They went home rejoicing. They went back to the field where it was cold and smelled like sheep. And sheep don't smell all that good. I'm telling you what, I spent a day with them, and I still remember what they smell like. They went back to life the way it was, but life was never the same again, never the same again, because God had come to them, and they knew that the promises were true. So we came to church this morning, and maybe we heard a little, the Lord be with you. Maybe you heard a little, God is good. All the time. Used to drive a Bonneville. No, forget that one. <laughs> But what I want you to hear, and what we're going to look at next week, when we look at looking back over the 40 years we've been in this location, and more than a century that this congregation has been in existence. And nobody here was here 100 and whatever years ago now for the original Epworth Church. Some of you have been here for the 40 years we've been here. Some of you go back to the old building. Some of you have come since. But we're going to look at where God is leading us in the future next week. But until we listen to that angel call to us and say, what? Because what do angels always say? Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid to invite people here. The United Methodist Church, we don't know what's going to happen to it next year, but don't be afraid to invite people here now because God needs us now. God will use us now to reach other people with the good news and the hope and the peace and the power of Jesus Christ. 
Don't be afraid to share your faith because somebody might think you're one of those crazy religious people. Go ahead and be a crazy religious person. If you aren't using it as a weapon against somebody else and saying, ah, oh, you need to get yourself saved because Jesus Christ is the Savior. People have asked me through the years, how many people have you saved during your ministry? And I say, not a daggone one. I am not the Savior of the world, but let me introduce you to him because he is with me every moment of my life. He found me where I was, and I was a mess. I was a hot mess, and I'm still a lukewarm mess some days. <laughs> but thanks be to God and Jesus Christ, I get closer all the time because I move closer to him because I am more aware of his presence every day. And let me tell you what, I have gone through some tough times in the last three years of my life. That's when I heard the good news most clearly. Just like the shepherds in the fields who had nothing else to hope for. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit does not mean to be doubtful or less faithful than others. Blessed are the poor in spirit means blessed are those who have come to understand that Jesus Christ is the only thing we have to depend on in our lives. God's love for us and our Savior. That is what hope is all about. And you don't necessarily need a lot of hope when you're doing okay on your own. But let me tell you, when things are rough and life hurts, that's when the good news is all the sweeter. I'm betting you know somebody who needs some good news. I'm betting you need somebody who needs to know that oppression and all those things that we have done to each other through the history of the world are not of God, not of Christ. There are people in the world who are hungry to be loved, to be accepted, to be brought into a fellowship and a family. That's why people go to bars, that's why people go to places where they can gather with others who will feed maybe their addiction, but not the needs of their heart. But if we're afraid, if we're afraid, if we're quiet, if we don't know what joy is and we don't embrace it and share it, no one will come to Christ through this congregation. I know you have it in you because I've seen it in you. I've seen the love that you have for other people. I've seen the commitment you have to this community. I've seen the commitment you have to your children. We gotta do that, folks in abundance and with joy because Christ came to make us whole. Christ came to save us, not for heaven. That comes with the package, but so that we might join the angels, that we might be the ones calling out. I read the old, well, John read, I chose the Old Testament passage today because I think it speaks powerfully. What do we say about shepherds? They are the lowest rung of Jewish society just about. And what does God promise to do but to shepherd us, to bring us home, to bind up our hearts, to carry us when we're too weak to walk on our own? So what is it that you do that maybe you think is not as good as what other people do? God can use that to bring other people to the truth of the love of our Savior Jesus Christ. I cannot imagine God saying, I will be among you like the ones you look down upon. I will be among you as one who is sent out into a cold field to take care of sheep. I will be among you as one who is not afraid of hard work. I will be among you as one who can stand the worst stink you have and pick you up and hold you to my heart and carry you home. That's who God is for us in Jesus Christ. And now it's our turn, not just to be the shepherds, but to be the angels. Because an angel is a heavenly being. They don't have wings in scripture, but they have a message from God. We have a message from God to others. Don't be afraid because you are loved and you are welcome and you are accepted. So my prayer for this congregation and all congregations is that we leave this place joyfully. Joy doesn't mean that you're happy. Joy doesn't mean that everything is going right in your life. Joy means that God is with you and that with God, nothing is impossible. So I we're reading Christmas a little early this year. We've even sung some Christmas carols. Forgive me, Dr. Stuckey. We've sung some Christmas carols during Advent because 
We want you to get into the habit of telling others the story because too many people have never heard it. And they can hear it from you in your words and mostly in the way you live your life. So are we going to live with joy? It's call and response, folks. Are we going to live with joy? Yes. Are we going to share the good news of Jesus Christ? Yes. Are we going to be afraid? No. Gotcha. <laughs> We're going to sing now a spiritual of call and response. The choir is going to call and we're going to respond. So please, as you're able, stand and join in singing.